morning, everyone. Uh, as you know, this is our, our makeup training session. A uh, couple disclaimers before we get rocking and rolling is this is all going to be videotaped so we can use it for future trainings for staff members uh, throughout the district. No, you will not be on video. Most of the time, I won't be on video, but the PowerPoint will, and everything that we say will. So if you've got questions during the presentation, I encourage you to ask them. Uh, Lieutenant Neal is here, Agent Martin is here, and if you guys don't ask a question, then uh, they'll jump in and ask some questions. We're gonna try to ask as many questions as possible. So if you have anything in your mind, don't hold it till after the meeting, please ask the question. When you raise your hand, Joe's gonna bring the mic to you, so you gotta speak into the mic so we can get your question uh, on video. Um, and uh, we'll be ready to rock and roll, okay? For those of you I have not personally met, I know I see you constantly throughout the week as walking around here, but uh, my name is Andrew Walters. I've had the pleasure of uh, serving as the Director of District Security for two years now, and uh, it's been an enlightening experience to say the least. Um, a lot of people think that law enforcement and security are two of the same thing, which they are not. A lot of it is almost direct opposites of looking at security. You've gotta look at it through a different lens it's just not as simple as coming in and how we solve problems in uniform patrol or investigations with the criminal acts. We've got to look at security of facilities and personnel and stuff like that, more from a crime prevention uh, set of lenses. Um, so it's been a, a learning experience for us as well. Um, when I started two years ago, um, we identified a list of high priorities for security. This is all pre-Parkland folks. Parkland, we were already talking, Dr. Mullins and myself were talking about what are the priorities to safeguard our district. And I could tell you, my number one priority was communication. Any time that we deal in law enforcement with a critical incident, and you might see it on the news, and it might be a hostage situation, a bank robbery, uh, a deputy involved shooting, whatever it might be, a, a pretty high, a high risk incident, communication is paramount is absolutely paramount. There's always an incident commander and we use what's called incident command system structure for communication. And the communication has not been less than par within our district. And we do a great job on communicating with parents and giving them updates on critical incidents and also what's happening with their children in schools. But where we fall a little bit short is where we communicate with our staff and where our staff has the ability to communicate with law enforcement and other staff members. So here we are today. We have a product, it's called Rave. Rave Panic Button and also Mutual Link. Those two companies have come together to partnership and your handouts will show that. Um, they partner and, and Rave is, is strictly the, the soft panic button. And then you've got Mutual Link that will tie in our cameras. We have a district-wide initiative that started uh, this year in 2019 and it will carry on into 2020 but we'll be expanding and enhancing our video surveillance uh, system within the schools to uh, help us better prepare as first responders responding to critical incidents. And the Ray Panic button is a lovely feature that allows us to notify all stakeholders instantaneously with the push of a button that we can notify law enforcement, fire rescue, and most importantly on your campus is notify all staff that have this app and it'll tell you what to do in an emergency situation, all right? We're gonna go through the presentation. There is a video that will, uh, will come up shortly, and a, that video is open on, on YouTube. If you go to YouTube over the weekend or, or tonight, and you wanna show your loved ones uh, this product, is show them the handouts, and go to, to YouTube and type in Rave Panic Button, and uh, it will come up and show them the same video you're gonna watch today. Look. Here is the situation with this product. Most security stuff we wanna keep quiet. We don't want the bad guy to know what we're doing within our district. We don't wanna be exposed on our security uh, 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 systems that we have here in emergency plans. This is something we want everybody to know that we have. If you're contemplating on hurting somebody on one of our school properties, we want you to know that we have the ability within a second and a half to notify everybody on campus, to notify law enforcement, fire rescue, and all support staff that we've got an emergency and what to do. I'm gonna reference some times that uh, happened at Marjorie Stillman Douglas. Um, we had the, the uh, pleasure of sitting through a debrief, a pretty extensive debrief of that incident. 
And there, there's always positive come out of a negative. So, um, and I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, two parents that lost their daughters at, at Parkland. And I obviously offer, offer my condolences, but I explained to them that their children did not die in vain. That there's a lot of lessons that we in law enforcement have learned because of the failed response in that, that now is gonna be saving lives in the future uh, from that incident. And I wanna reference those times because I, I, I want you to understand that time will save lives. And this product, the Rave Panic Button, will save lives without a doubt, okay? We covered a lot of this stuff in the beginning uh, in my intro with you all. How do we keep students safe? How do we keep staff safe? I think the number one priority is communication. And we've got to be able to do effective and timely communication in a critical incident. And this product allows us to do that. And there we are. When you go to uh, um, YouTube and you type in Rave Panic Button, you'll get a couple different videos. This is what you want to see in YouTube. This is the, uh, the icon. Click on that and you'll see the video, okay? When an emergency strikes, seconds and minutes can mean the difference between life and death. Every 15 seconds that an active shooter has unrestricted access to more people, he will claim another victim. Or when someone goes into cardiac arrest and their heart stops beating, every one minute that passes without the initiation of CPR, there's a 10% decrease in survival. It goes without saying, rapid response is critical to saving lives in an emergency. Schools, businesses, healthcare, and government facilities experience emergencies of all types every day. If an emergency occurs at work, the Rave Panic Button smartphone app quickly connects you to 911 and at the same time sends an alert to your colleagues and any security personnel on campus. The app can be used during any type of crisis situation, such as incidents that require immediate 911 assistance or cases where only facility staff members need to be notified. How does the Rave Panic Button app work? During the initial setup, administrators are chosen for your facility and will enter information about the campus at www.smart911facility.com. They can enter facility details such as buildings, floor plans, and landlines, as well as employee names, email addresses, and mobile phone numbers. Once you've been entered into the system by an administrator, you can then download and register with the app iPhone users will download from the Apple App Store and Android users from the Google Play Store. In the store, click search, then type Rave Panic Button in the search bar. Now, downloaded the Rave Panic Button app and an emergency occurs at your facility where 911 needs to be notified. Whether you are calling from an iPhone or an Android, first identify the button option that closest relates to your emergency. Hold the button down for 1.5 seconds to activate the emergency call. Both iPhone and Android users will be prompted to first confirm the emergency call before being connected to 911. For instance, if you activate panic button shooter on campus, the app will immediately connect you to 911 and send an emergency alert to all employees at the same time. However, if you activate the medical emergency button, 911 will be dialed, but only key administrators and staff with medical training will be notified. Not all urgent situations require dialing 911. For instance, let's say a school teacher witnesses a minor injury during recess. The teacher can then choose the staff assist feature to only notify the nurse on campus and key administrators. Another example may be if the smoke detector goes off at your facility but turns out to just be a false alarm. Staff assist can then be used to notify all on-site employees that it is safe to re-enter the building. Now that we've discussed how the panic button app can help in an emergency, what are the next steps? Number one, ensure your employer has your mobile phone number and email address so you will be authorized to register with the app. Number two, download the Rave Panic Button app, then register your information. Number three, in the event of an emergency, use the Rave Panic Button app to be connected to 911 and automatically notify others on campus. 
There are answers to the most commonly asked questions about Rave Panic Button online at www.ravepanicbutton.com, but it's worth addressing a few of them in this video. The first question most commonly asked is, is it a requirement to download and use the Rave Panic Button app? While most organizations have not required their employees to download the Rave Panic Button app, it is highly recommended that you do. The app provides a faster notification and communication process, which could be life-saving in an emergency. The second question states, do employees have to use the Rave Panic Button app to call 911? While you are encouraged to use the app to make an emergency call, you should contact 911 in the fastest and safest way possible. The third question most commonly asked is, what happens if an individual activates the Rave Panic Button app while off campus? The answer to this question is, your phone will still dial 911, but no emergency notifications will be sent to employees due to your location at the time of the call. And finally, is it worth providing my mobile phone number to my employer if I do not have a phone that can support the Rave Panic Button app or if I simply do not want to download it? This is a great question. If you do not have the app installed on your phone, you can still receive SMS text and email when there is an incident on your campus that you need to be aware of. Therefore, it is highly recommended that you still provide your contact information to your employer whether or not you intend to download the app. To learn more about the Rave Panic Button app, go to www.ravepanicbutton.com. If I wasn't on video, I would probably start making some comments right now. So I'm being very well behaved right now. Anyways, um, all, all, all kidding aside, that video is just shy of eight minutes long. It seems like it only takes took like two or three minutes long. Um, when you're in a critical incident, it's going to seem like it takes forever and ever. This video, the time it just took for you all to watch this video was about the same time it took for crews at Douglas High School on Valentine's Day, exiting an Uber vehicle, walking on campus, entering a 1200 building, arming himself and shooting 34 people. And out of the 34 that were shot, 17 died that day and then leave campus. It happens that quick, that quick, okay? Um, as you saw in that video, and it's a very good video, so get a complete recap of what I'm about to talk about. So at any time you feel that you wanna ask, some, you have some questions, we're always open to district security, to you all to answer any questions you might have, but you always can watch this video and it should answer most of your questions. Um, all of you who voluntarily sign up, we can't mandate, unless you have a BPS phone, we cannot mandate you put something on your personal phone, all right? We're encouraging you to, because this is gonna save lives. We're gonna go through all the myths about us being able to track you, having access to your phone and all that stuff at the end of the video so you know that they're all false. But uh, hopefully you will make the decision to arm yourself so you can save your life and then save other people around you if we do have a critical incident, all right? If you decide that you're gonna have it on your phone and you're primarily assigned to ESF, then you'll be set up to ESF. So that means that you'll get all alerts for ESF and then you can lock down and activate an emergency here at ESF. If you travel to other locations throughout the district, there's some of you in the room that travel to every, have the potential to be at every school site, every transportation site, if that's the case, then you will be set up for district wide. So the chances are your phone might go off during the day and it might be uh, an emergency at Bayside and then you're, you're gonna have a little, you're gonna have to get used to it, all right? Uh, because your phone goes off, you're gonna be looking at it thinking it might be where you're at right here, but it's not. It might be Bayside Heritage or even Titusville or Astronaut High School, okay? The only caution is, is on the medical alert, and we'll get to that. Unless you are in a situation that you can offer immediate medical assistance, you probably don't wanna get those alerts, because that's primarily the, the main alerts we're gonna get on medical alerts, all right? But you will set up, be able to be set up for multiple locations. When we go back to that, you only can be set up for one phone unless you have a BPS assigned phone. If you have a BPS assigned phone, you can have BPS phone and also your personal phone. But if you don't, you only can have one personal phone. And a lot of people ask, hey, can I have my child on it? Can I have my loved one on it? My husband or my wife wanna know where, what's going on. Or I've got my son that goes to Maradon High School 
can I get married on high school too so I know when they got alerts, we can't do that. We can't do that. We don't need you here working and then we get an alert and if it's not an actual emergency, you freaking out here at work and being upset and hysterical. We don't, we don't need that. So that's across the board in the district, okay? If you, it's not clear by now, folks, that you are empowered to lock down and activate any emergency procedure in this district. Let it be clear now, all right? The superintendent has authorized every single employee that works for Brevard Public Schools to activate any emergency procedure for any BPS location. The days of just the principal and administrative staff and senior staff or just law enforcement are able to lock down a school are done with. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, there was, they had, let me just set the stage on that school. It's about twice the size of Vieira High School, close to 4,000 students. It was seventh period. They had about 15 to 20 minutes left in class. They have seven campus monitors on that campus, seven. You know, most of our high schools only have one, and some don't have any. Uh, they had seven at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. They unlocked all the perimeter gates before school gets out so the kids can go out and walk on out and go home. So that's what they did. They unlocked all the gates. There was a campus monitor that was going across the parking lot that saw Cruz get out of the Uber car. And he described him. He gave testimony to the commission and described him to a T. He was wearing an NYPD ball cap, an ROTC polo shirt, slacks. And I know it's hard to imagine, but he testified to the fact that he witnessed him carrying a rifle case. And he didn't recognize his name. He forgot his name, but he knew he was the crazy kid. That's what he referred to him as, the crazy kid. Now, I know you all, we're all Monday morning quarterbackers. We've got the crystal ball. We can figure it all out. I get it. But not even being overly critical to that, look at all the check marks. You've got a person that's not supposed to be on campus that's coming on campus. He's coming at an odd time. He's wearing different clothes that they normally the student's not going to be wearing, an NYPD hat and the, the ROTC when it's not ROTC time. But most importantly, they've had issues with him, and he's also carrying a rifle case. I mean, come on. They didn't put the school in lockdown. Three minutes and 30 seconds is how long it took them to put that school in lockdown, folks. Lives are lost because of the delay in that timely notification. Those days have got to be gone throughout our districts, without a doubt. We need to have immediate notifications when we have a perceived or actual threat of bodily harm. See, he's an active shooter. He's an armed intruder. You're going to see is I don't like the word active shooter. And what will come across your phone in that alert is armed intruder. Okay? At that point, he's an armed intruder. Actual or perceived, that could have been a guitar case, but if they think that that's a gun case, that's good enough for me to put the school in lockdown. Then let law enforcement do their job and render that person safe and say, hey, it's just electric guitar, release the lockdown. How long does that take? Less than three and a half minutes. No doubt about it. No harm, no foul. Rather take those precautions, go save lives. In Marjorie Stone and Douglas, you had three floors within the 1200 building. In that building, it was relatively new. You had double stairwell, double stairs going between each floor. And you know with new buildings, they're going to have good insulated doors for fire coats. Our facility guys are here. They know that. They're going to have heavy doors. They're going to have to stay closed and all that good stuff. What that does is act as a sound uh, suppression system. You're not going to hear things as, as clear. Everybody thinks that there was a fire alarm pulled at that school that day. There was no fire alarm pulled. They had infrared fire detection system in the ceiling. So when, when Cruz started shooting on the first floor, the smoke from his gun set off the fire alarm. Okay? The folks on the second floor, all the classes were full. The, the teachers and the students on the second floor heard the fire alarm, but they also did, uh, recognized and distinguished that they were gunshots on the first floor. So they immediately went to lockdown without being told. All, that st all the staff on the second floor took leadership roles and says, we're going to lockdown. We don't need to be told to go to lockdown. We're going to lockdown. Now, unfortunately, the third floor, all they heard was a thud sound. They couldn't distinguish that they were gunshots. And they heard the fire alarm. And you can't write the script, but they did a fire drill earlier that day. 
So they're thinking, hey, we got 15, 20, come on, look at the mentality of, of these folks in high school. And 14, 15, up to 18 years old, and they go, 15 minutes to get out of school, we got a fire alarm, grab your backpack, and that's what the picture was on video that we saw, is you had hundreds of kids in the hallway with their backpacks thinking, hey, we're just gonna go out and we'll get out early today. But when crews entered the second floor is when they recognized this isn't a fire drill, and they had to scramble to get in their rooms. The reason why I tell you that, and I bring that story to light, is because of what the faculty did on the second floor. They did our drills, there's no doubt. That's why we stressed to our staff about practicing their drills, being aware of what a shelter in place is, what a lockdown is, what an evacuation is, because that's what they did. They, their doors were locked, they went to the safest spot, and you here at ESF, it's the safest spot within your office area, we, you all know that. Go to the safest spot and wait for direction. That's what they did, and nobody died on the second floor. Nobody died because they were in lockdown. If they weren't in lockdown, people would have been injured, if not dead, on the second floor. Okay. When we talk about all stakeholders being notified, that is truly all stakeholders, and probably the most important stakeholder, you probably think it's law enforcement first responders, but it's not. It's you in this room. It's our employees because the reality is, is that when you have less than eight minutes outside law enforcement getting here in time, it normally doesn't happen that way. First responders aren't normally arriving on the scene and actually have that active shooter and can eliminate them. It has happened, but that's where we're relying on our armed personnel who are on campus at that time to eliminate that threat, all right? But this is where you can safeguard yourself to get into a lockdown, to evacuate the building, to run, Whatever it might be, you will be armed with the information to be able to react through this app, okay? But all stakeholders being notified, this is the only system that, that we know of. I mean, there's other systems out there that offer a similar line of product, but this is the one that we know has been tested in Central Florida and has proven to work. That we can notify all staff, we can notify all first responders, and all of our dispatch centers will be notified. Because if we have a critical incident here at ESF, it's Sheriff's Office territory, in jurisdiction, but I can tell you is that we got a lot of city uh, law enforcement that are at court that might be driving past here, going to Health First to work out or whatever it might be, that will hear the call come out and it becomes a multi-jurisdictional incident instantly. So all of our dispatch centers will get notified when anybody pushes any of these buttons. So they're already witnessing and watching the incident unfold. So if we need to send additional resources from Palm Bay up here, Coco, Rockledge over here, to help us out. So it's a great, great, great tool. The direct 911 connection, as you can tell when you hit one of the buttons on there to activate the emergency, to notify everybody, it's gonna ask you confirm or cancel to call 911. It doesn't automatically dial 911. We're asking you, even if you can't talk, still dial 911, still hit that button. Most of our schools don't have great cell technology this app does not work off cell technology. It works off the internet. As long as you have an internet connection through our Wi-Fi or through your data plan, then it will work. It doesn't rely on cell technology, which is a positive for us because we have a very robust Wi-Fi system throughout the district. And a lot of the data plans get better and better, actually better than the doggone cell technology. So as long as you can get on the internet, your app will work and be able to activate and send and receive alerts, okay? But what we're asking you is to make sure you call 911. Just don't hang up, especially if it's a false alert or you make the alert and you determine, hey, it's not that significant because what happens is you're now communicating with our dispatch because once we get the alert, we're instantly on the radio talking to our dispatchers, finding out, hey, is this, is this live? And what's the deal? What's going on? Where is it pinging? All, this, all these questions we're asking from a law enforcement perspective so we can develop our tactful response to the incident. But if you are able to communicate with them and tell them, hey, look, it's been resolved. The guy, it's, it's a parent. It's not an armed person. We're good. That's information we can get instantly and get out to everybody. Because you remember, you're going to have staff members on, that, on this campus that are thinking that it's a real emergency and preparing for that, which is the right thing to do. But if it's not, we want to tell them as soon as possible that it's not a real emergency. Everything's been resolved, okay? 
We talked about mutual link. The one thing I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on mutual link, but um, what mutual link is going to allow us to do is when you activate your phone or when you get an emergency alert, our dispatch center in the sheriff's office in Titusville and also district security, our cameras at that location, the system will automatically default to those cameras. So for an example, we got Kennedy Middle School in Rockland, just say that we had an incident going on there. Could be a medical emergency that we had a child having a heart attack. Once that alert, uh, that the alert goes out, our cameras in district security and also at the sheriff's office will automatically default to any and all cameras at Kennedy Middle School. Then what we're able to do is pinpoint where it's at and we can share those camera views with other people that are the incident commander at the, at, the, uh, at, at the school. Or we can share it with Rockledge Dispatch. So now we, as law enforcement, first responders, can now have eyes inside a school, and instead of going in blind to clear it, now we can actually see what's going on in that school. And then that's where our dispatchers can get timely updates. So if you're in a lockdown situation and they defaulted to ESF cameras, they might be able to tell us, hey, they're over in pod four. Now dispatch doesn't know where pod four is. Half the time, <laughs> gotta go to the trash can. What is that? A, is that a brown trash can or blue trash can? But anyways, we, we, but they will be able to tell us, hey, they're in pod four. And so that, that is invaluable to us. Otherwise, we're going in blind and it takes that much longer to clear every single pod. It takes more personnel and we're trained so that you all know we're not trained by how Broward County was trained. We are trained that we are a single response unit. If I'm here by myself and I don't have uh, Lieutenant Neal or Agent Martin with me, I don't wait till the sirens pull in the parking lot. I go run in and try my best to eliminate that threat to safeguard each of you. Same thing, that's our expectations of Lieutenant Neal and Agent uh, Martin. Anybody that wears a uniform member of our county is trained that way, all right? The rave command view, that's a basically rave on steroids. It has a lot more resources within that, that software package. That's not what you receive, that's what our dispatch centers receive. So every single dispatch center in Brevard County, just not the sheriff's office and district security, but Titusville, Cocoa, Rockledge, Cocoa Beach, the list goes on, Melbourne, Palm Bay, Satellite Beach, Indian Atlantic, Indian Harbor, all those agencies have command view in their dispatch centers. What is command view? Command view, basically, their desktop computer will make the same amber alert sound when an alert is activated. So that's district-wide. It goes off, they're gonna instantly see the school location where the alert's going off in Google Earth. It's gonna have a pin drop of where you were at when you activated that emergency. It doesn't move with you, it just pin drops where, exactly where you were at when you hit that button for a second and a half. Then it also has all the emergency contacts for the school and anybody that's on the RAVE program assigned to that location and it also shows the fish plan for the location, emergency shutoffs, all the camera locations, a lot of information that we will be asking over the radio as we're running lights and sirens coming to that location because we need to prepare our response and where we assign units to respond to, okay? Definitely an added tool. The other thing about command view, and I'll back up, which is really cool, if you're in a situation and you're on ESF and you don't have cell technology, the 911 will come through as a hang up, as a disconnected line. They're not gonna be able to actually have verbal communication with you. Through Command View, our dispatch centers are gonna be able to send you a message through the Rave app. And what they're gonna tell you is you need to go text, text 911. If you didn't realize it, but Brevard County has text 911. If you go into your text and put 911 and you type in a message and send that, that will go to the Sheriff's Office Dispatch Center. They, they are the main clearinghouse for those. So if it turns out that you're in the city of Melbourne, they'll transfer that to Melbourne Police Department. But they're gonna tell you that because you might be in an office lockdown. You can, and here at ESF, we have window punches in those different locations. So you might be in there listening and you can't talk because you wanna silence everything and be quiet but the next thing you know, you could be communicating, giving us relevant information. Hey, somebody's outside my door right now. I'm in finance, this is where I'm at. 
See where I'm going with that? You have more options than actually verbally communicating. And that's the lovely thing through this app. Okay, geofencing. We had a question earlier, we're gonna have her ask it again here shortly, but uh, geofencing. I had no idea what geofencing was. Sorry, I was an idiot when we launched this thing. I didn't know what it was, but I learned something new, so that's pretty cool. But geofencing is just simply on Google Earth where we, we create an imaginary boundary line for each site. So ESF has imaginary boundary line that covers all the way from Stadium Parkway to Judge Fran Jameson Road, all the way out to the, the wellness clinic and the whole parking lot. We are separate from Vieira. So there is a distinguish about a two to four foot area between us and Vieira High School that are separate because we don't want somebody activating it on ESF and then Vieira High School get the alert that we've got a problem at Vieira High School. So we have to distinguish where you're at. What's the purpose of geofence? Geofence, uh, the boundary, is what signifies where you're at with the app. So the app that's in your phone, the Rave Panic Button app, is once you arrive here at ESF, once you pull into that parking lot and you're inside that geofence, your app will read emergent or uh, educational support facility, ESF. All right, same thing is if you were assigned to Vieira High School, right, when you walk down that golf cart path, boom, it switches to Vieira High School. It tells the app where to send out the alerts to, okay? Because every location has a list of personnel assigned to that location that will receive the alerts. Now, the geofence, in order to send out an alert, the armed intruder, medical, fire, 911, or police, any of those buttons to send out and notify anybody, you have to be inside that geofence, all right? But you can be anywhere in this world and receive alerts that there's a problem there, okay? One more time. You've gotta be on the school site or BPS site. You gotta be within that geofence. If you're on the property, you're in the parking lot, anywhere on that property, trust me, you are inside that geofence. You can send out an alert. You can be anywhere in the United States to receive it. So the question earlier, and I'll go ahead and repeat your question. If my child is playing on my phone, can they send out a district-wide alert? To anybody, if they hit that button for a second and a half. Because that is possible, it's gonna happen. I can tell you, no doubt it's gonna happen. Only if your child is playing on your phone and they're at ESF or they're at any school. If they're playing on your phone inside one of the geofences, the answer is yes, they sure can. Now what your child can do, or anybody else, including yourself, if you're showing a neighbor or you're showing a loved one saying, hey, check out this cool new app we've got at the school board, it's gonna save lives, there's no doubt. All you gotta do is hold this button down and you see the little black thing going around, right when it gets to the top, boom! You're not gonna alert anybody unless you're at work, okay? But it will ask you, do you wanna call 911? And that's if you hit yes, then you're gonna get one of us there showing up at your house. So, the reason being is that um, the, the app has to know where you are at, where the emergency is at, and who do we notify. If it doesn't know that, then it doesn't notify anybody, okay? As you can see on here, this is a school in Seminole County, but that pin drop right there, that's what will come up to us. That's the only time we can track you. So we can't track you throughout the day. You're not a pin drop that comes up on our little map. We can see that you're traveling around or you kind of snuck out the back door to head to Subway and you took a two hour lunch and nobody knew you were gone. Trust us, we can't track you, all right? The only time that we can track you is when you push one of the buttons. Now who doesn't want to be tracked? Who doesn't want to tell everybody in the world where they're at when they have an emergency situation? Okay, so that's the only time that we know where you're at. And to be honest with you, that all we rely on that for is that's where it was activated. That's it, because it's, it's a very great possibility that you can activate it here in the boardroom and then run out that door and start running through the pods and you're no longer in here. And when we get in here, there's nobody in here. That, that pin drop does not follow you. It's only as good as when you activated the app, okay? 
So we can't follow you. That's one of the myths you're going to see. So just a, a final recap on the geofence. Every single location, I think we've got like 104. Right now, maybe 105. Uh, all the adult eds, all of the ancillary sites from facilities to all the bus compounds. We've got a variety of different little sites uh, throughout uh, Brevard County, but every school site, every location is been geofenced. Okay? And you remember, you got to be in the geofence to send out an alert, and you can be anywhere to receive. That's a lovely thing. If you did leave here for lunch or a dentist appointment or something else, you had to run home real quick, and on your way back, your phone's going off saying, hey, we've got an emergency at ESF locked down immediately, or we've got law enforcement activity in the area, and we need to shelter in place, then you know you're not coming back to ESF right now. So that's nice. Nice that you get that. And that's what we have, constant BPS traffic to and from school sites. And we want you to be alerted before you get there if they're dealing with an emergency, all right? This is a recap that's on your handouts. And it's just a, to show you a, a visual description of what the stakeholders are and what happens when any of those buttons are pushed. As you can see in the bottom left, a 911, an option to call 911. Uh, it notifies uh, first responders and all of our dispatch centers. When I say first responders, all, our fire rescue folks as well have been notified of this. And the battalion chiefs for Brevard County Fire Rescue have this on their phones. So if we did have a medical emergency here requiring an ambulance and somebody hit the medical emergency button, they're gonna get the alert. And they're gonna get that alert before a 911 call comes in. So our hope is, is that they utilize the app so they can go ahead and start the trucks and the ambulances coming this way. Even though they have no idea why they're coming here, is get the wheels turning, get them turning. Because when you're on your way, you're gonna get the updates of what's going on. That's gonna expedite their response here. And that will save lives. We all know that. All right. The other thing is you got mutual link. It automatically defaults to the camera system. And then all, and again, to me, this is the most important part of this app is you in this room, is our staff. You get that immediate notification so you can take immediate action on safeguarding yourself and those around you. Okay. Here are the rave buttons. Like I told you, I don't like the word active shooter. Uh, depending on what media outlet you like to watch, you're going to get a variety of responses on documented active school shooters. The young lady who took her own life over at Lake Mary High School this year will be classified as an active shooter by some media outlets. But I could tell you that was not an active shooting incident. That's somebody that took their own life. An active shooter incident at a, at a school setting, uh, in our interpretation of it, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission, uh, interpretation is somebody who has intent to cause mass casualties on any work location or school site. For the last 20 years, and the Marjorie Stillman Douglas Commission did a very good job in thoroughly looking into this. They used federal, state, and local crime analysts, but they identified 46 active shooter on school locations over the last 20 years. Not 150, not 300 that you'll hear in the media. 46 truly documented, intended, mass casualty shootings on school campuses. Out of those 46, 43 were current and prior students. Current and prior students, that's amazing. It's amazing, only three of them were outside folks that had nothing to do with the school. Or might have had something to do with the school, but they weren't a current or prior student. We're a little bit different here at ESF and some of our ancillary sites. You don't get a lot of general, well we get general public here but it's not like you get a bunch of kids. We don't have the current and prior students. What we have is employees. And you see employee violence all the time. So that's what we have to be aware of here at ESF. That's what they need to be aware of at the facilities, locations that are bus depots, is current employees that might be going through some difficulties. And that's when we really strongly urge folks is if you see something, say something so we can get them the help they need to hopefully for prevent something like that, okay? But the active shooter, I don't like to use it all the time because we have other incidents well documented where people are armed with other things. It could be a club, it could be a hammer, it could be a book bag, you don't know. It could be, be anything out there that can cause great bodily injury to somebody. And that's why when that alert comes through, 
What's good, what you're going to see on your phone when you hear that Amber Alert sound is you're going to see the person's name who activated it. It's very important because you all know a lot of people here at ESF. It's not going to give their location to you, but it's going to give you their name. And you're going to go, you know what? That person works in food services. They're probably over there in whatever pod that is in food services. Oh, hey, they're HR. They're probably in the front of the building. It's going to give you some idea where they're at on this facility. Same thing with the school. A lot of people know where the teachers are at or where they might be at. And so they go, hey, they're in building four. I'm in building one. So then they can make a decision on how they react. Do we lock down? Do we evacuate? What do we do? See where I'm going with that? That's why we have the person's name on there. The other thing it's going to have is the location. It's going to say what, what school you're at or what location you're at, what ancillary site, ESF, or where you're at. Then it's going to read this, arm intruder, lock down immediately, silence your cell phones. That's all stuff that's in our emergency plans. you got to remember to silence your cell phone. Now here's something about the app. The app is not going to give you that amber alert sound if your cell phone is silent. Okay? So you're safeguarded if you're locked down and you silence your cell phone, put it on vibrator silent. If somebody else hit the button, it's not going to send out an audible sound to show your location and where you're at. That's nice. But during the day, a lot of people keep their phones on vibrate and keep it on their belt. What we're encouraging you to do is don't do that because that you won't hear that amber alert sound. I don't know about you, but if your phone's on vibrate, unless you're addicted to looking at every time it goes off, you're gonna have the potential of missing an alert. You want to hear that amber alert sound because you're not going to hear it that often. But when you do hear it, you need to key up to it because there's the potential of having a significant emergency and where you're at. All right. It's not a big change for us at ESF and some of the other sites. A huge change for our teachers because most of them keep their phones on vibrate or silent on their desk while they're teaching. And now they're going to have to change that up. Either they carry it all the time and they look at it when it goes off or they keep it, the audio on so they can hear that amber alert and tell folks, just don't call me during the day. Okay? But I just want to make sure you knew that. But that's what will come up, armed intruder. And you notice over here it says active or perceived. Just think about Cruz. He was a perceived threat. He wasn't actually shooting. We don't have to wait till they're actually harming people. Just remember that if there is a strong likelihood that that threat, whatever the threat might be, is likely to cause serious or great bodily harm without intervention, we need to make alerts, all right? And I know a lot of you are thinking, wow, I don't want to push the button because, you know, I don't want to overreact. I get that, but trust me, there's several people in this room, you don't have to show hands, that have been in some life and death situations, there's no doubt. When you know you're in that situation, you know there's a threat, Trust me, the hair will rise up on the back of your neck. There is no doubt in your mind. You know you need law enforcement there like yesterday. You need them there pronto. When you get that feeling, hit that button. If we render it safe and it's fine, it's fine. I'd rather you overreact than underreact, okay? The medical, I don't recommend you signing up for this unless you have prior medical uh, and you've been a nurse or physician or paramedic or in the military have any of that experience. Um, if you are AED and CPR certified and you, you're here at ESF and you wanna get those alerts, then sign up for it, all right? The secretaries at each of the divisions have the spreadsheet. If uh, for some reason they don't have it, get with my assistant, Audrey Lampkin. You can send her an email and she'll add you instantly to the, to the system so you can download the app. But what, we, what we'll need is your full name, um, your cell phone number, all, all uh, 10 digits, and then your BPS email. And then you'll be added to the system. But uh, you'll either be added for all staff alerts or all staff alerts in medical. So, but if you don't want the medical alerts, then, then just say no on that, okay? There'll be plenty of people here to have medical alerts already. Trust me, we already have them signed up, okay? But that's what we'll come across, medical emergency on campus. And everybody's wondering, well, that doesn't tell me anything. You know, remember the command view. It's going to tell us where it pings. We just want to, the folks that have medical experience to know, and they're going to be able to see the name on there. So we'll give them a good general location of where to head. All right? 
the fire. If somebody hits this, there's a good chance this is a little bit more serious, I know it sounds crazy, than a fire alarm going off, all right? Because there's a lot of things that can affect a fire alarm. An electrical panel, something messed up with the power, somebody accident or intentionally pulls it, uh, there could be a little smoke from one of the, the HVAC system, who knows? There's a variety of reasons I've seen in two years here at BPS that have caused fire alarms to go off. But I could tell you this, I haven't seen an actual full-blown fire in any of our alarms. If somebody at a school site or ESF opens up their phone, opens up the Rave app and holds down for a second and a half the fire button, if I'm playing Texas Hold'em, I'm all in that there's something going on. It might not be serious enough for the entire facility to evacuate, but there's no doubt there's something going on. There is no such thing as an accidental activation of the Rave app. There are too many steps. Your pocket can't do it. Your pocketbook can't do it. Your fingers and your mind have to do it. Multiple steps to open up your phone, open up the app, and then intentionally holding it down for a second and a half, the button, the emergency button. So there's no accidental dials. Is there false notifications? Oh yeah, there sure are but it's an intentional act to go into the app and actually push something. That's why I'm saying when this thing goes off, all hands on deck until we determine otherwise. But that fire one, it's consistent with our emergency plans that we shelter in place unless you smell smoke or see flames. We don't need mass panic, uh, and especially in schools, of the entire school evacuating if we don't have to, all right? Police and 911, I don't know why they have police and 911 on there, but we don't have the ability to customize the screen of the app, unfortunately, or we would have customized it differently. But essentially what I want you to get out of this with the police and 911 is if you're inside a geofence and you're at work and you use this app to call 911, it will do it, just, it's calling 911 just like you call it on your phone. But what the app does, it pin drops you. And it also tells us your name, so in case you can't talk, it, we get your name, we get your number, we get the pin drop, we get your location. A lot more information we don't get right away if you can't talk on that phone and need a, and have an emergency. So you might be walking out to your car, it's late at night, and it might be dark, and you see somebody that looks suspicious, and you want to call 911 to get somebody rolling. If you held this down, it'll pin drop you that you're in a parking lot. So the responding deputies out here, all, every corporal, sergeant, and lieutenant at West Precinct, at all of our precincts, at all of our PDs have this app. So the ones that are working are gonna get, our phones are gonna go off like Amber Alert. They're gonna see that and go, hey, they're in ESF parking lot, there's an emergency. There are lights and sirens right here to ESF. And you haven't even talked to the first dispatcher on 911. That's how beautiful this app is, and how quick it can work. But what will come up is emergency on campus, shelter in place. So what that just tells somebody here, if you're here working late or you got here early and it's at, hey, stay where you're at. Don't leave and go in the hallway, stay where you're at until you get more information, all right? The staff assist. This is really applicable to our schools and the way it's designed, but it still can be used for us. This is the part that what I really, really love about this app is this now gives us the ability in district security and law enforcement and administration to give you timely updates on what's going on. So if you guys are in a shelter in place, if you are in a lockdown, if you had to evacuate to one of our sites, the wellness center or the golf cart area at Vieira High School, we can give you updates of what's going on. So you're just not left out there in the unknown world of knowing what, what's happening. This is if you're in a lockdown, you're in that office and you're scared to death and we're clearing it, we're able to give you constant updates through the, through the app and saying, hey, look, at law enforcement's on campus, we're doing a clear of all the buildings, everything is okay, we believe everything is eliminated, but stay where you're at, do not leave where you're at. And then we can continuously be feeding you those updates, which we will, all right? So what, uh, the nice thing is you remember, staff assist is a little bit different when we talk about the geofence. So you can be inside that geofence or outside it to send and receive. So just because you're an evacuation site, just say you, you took off and you ran, and you're over at the government center, you're at the Moore Justice Center, you're over at Vieira Charter School, and you, because you're out in the parking lot, or you took off in your car and you went. 
we were, you are still able to receive the staff assist there. I literally can be down in Palm Bay, be given updates and thinking, hey, nobody's put out a staff assist to these people. Let me tell them what's going on. I can tell everybody that's assigned here, over 700 people who are assigned here, and tell them, hey guys, this is the update. This is what's happening. Fire rescue is checking things out. Matt Reed can send updates. Staff can send those updates to you guys instantly and continuously feed you information. So instead of you wondering what's going on, you can get those updates. That's through staff assist, it's beautiful. You only are uh, administrative staff and uh, district security have the custom feature. And hopefully you'll understand this. We couldn't create a group chat. <laughs> that was one of my questions. If we do have an emergency, let's use an example, and we're in a lockdown. We've got a suspicious person walking through ESF or any of the schools, and we needed to go to a lockdown. If we opened up a chat room and allowed everybody to chime into that, it could just totally clog up the system because you know there's gonna be a handful that are upset or nervous and they're gonna constantly be typing in there, texting, and it, it, it breaks down our whole communication. We have to have single points of communication to everybody. So that's why we've limited to administrative staff and district security. And our SROs at all the schools and our safety specialists at the schools will have the ability to communicate directly with uh, all staff, okay? and create a custom message. Everybody else has to pick one of the uh, 10 categories or, or types of incidents that you wanna talk about and notify us about. And we're gonna go over it right here. So if you look at your uh, handout and you look at the front of the screen, that K-12 handout, and you look at the bottom of the app screen, you'll see what they called staff assist. When you hit that button down at the bottom, Everybody see that? You hit that button, what will come up is this screen. And we took the screenshot for ESF. So you got education services facility. I think I called it educational support facility, whatever, ESF, y'all get it. Um, this is what will come up. Once you hit that button, it's instantly, boom, it comes up, identifies where you're at. If you were at uh, Manatee Elementary School, it would come up Manatee Elementary School. Now the nice thing is now, since we've done this, we have broken down ESF to ESF building, ESF parking lot, and I believe the wellness center. Is that correct? I think there's three different locations. So, is that what it says? Just two? Okay, so it has ESF and ESF parking lot. So you might, if you're in the parking lot, it will read that you're in the parking lot. And so if you've got a staff assist in the parking lot, something going on, you might have a suspicious person that's not requiring a full lockdown, but you need to let somebody know in district security, we got a problem. We're gonna go to that just one second. So once you hit that blue button there, nothing to require other than you hitting that button will bring up this screen. You hit that blue button right there, this is what will come up. You select your message. It's kind of hard to see it, but you have a, a child missing. Now again, this is for schools, folks, so bear with it here. You got child missing, cleanup, CPI team, disruptive student, a fight, irate parent, Minor injury is number seven. That's important one for the schools because they don't need to hit the medical emergency if they don't need an ambulance. That's why they're being trained. You only hit that if you need an ambulance. But if it's a child that just got bumps and bruises and need to nurse or somebody else, then hit minor injury. The other three that you can't see there because it's a screenshot is a suspicious person. We got a lot of folks that will walk around and not have a visitor badge and they're acting a little bit strange. But this isn't a full blown lockdown but I need somebody to check them out in district security. So you can, act, you can go in here, you can be, walk right into the bathroom, hit staff assist, or walk into your office, staff assist, and hit uh, suspicious person. Then, there, then I'll show you the next screen what you do. Hit submit, eh, eh, eh. we're getting that alert. We're immediately responding to go check out that person. See how that works? Very cool. But you have suspicious person, and you have a student with drugs, and then you also have a threat, students making threats, because we get a lot of threats of kids talking about, hey, I'm gonna bring a gun to school, or I'm gonna take this person out, and there's they're a lot of lip service, but we have the responsibility of thoroughly investigating those. But a, a teacher can just hit that on their phone, 
immediately go to the SRO and Ministry of Staff. They go right to the classroom and pull the kid out of class. All right? These are all features that we don't need to hit any of those buttons in the front. We don't need to law, notify law enforcement, don't need to notify medical, we don't need to put place in lockdown or shelter in place, but we need a little bit of assistance. And we don't have a two-way radio to call somebody, okay? Once you pick your option, we just did child missing as an example. Down here in this box, you can type up to 99 characters. You see down at the bottom, it says B. Neal, because this was Brian's. If you did this, your name, first initial, last name will come up. So everybody knows it came from you, who it's going to. But then you can type right down here what's happening. Hey, I'm over here, I went into the bathroom, I saw this guy, he's walking towards facilities, looks a little bit weird. And he smells like he has alcohol on him or he's drunk or whatever it might be. Give us as much information, clothing description, race, sex, whatever it might be, so that when we respond, we can handle it. Because if we're not here on campus, guess what we're doing? We're getting hold of West Precinct to have a deputy respond to help you guys. All right, see how that works? Good stuff. And then all you gotta do, hit send, boop, instantly. We're all getting that alert. All right, we talked about miss. Your personal information is exposed. That's absolutely false. By Florida statute, the only employees that their names are not open to public record are our safety specialists that are out at the schools. Their name is not uh, releasable under uh, Florida Statute Chapter 119. But if anybody want to know who you were, they can get your name. If they wanted to know your BPS email address, it's a public email address, they can get your email address. Now what they can't get is your personal cell phone. But the lovely thing is, is that this whole system, the whole database, everything is housed in district security. It's not housed in IT, it's not managed by IT, it's not managed by HR. We control that data entry in district security. So when that public records request come in, if y'all don't know, they go through Mr. Reed's office, then Ms. Mr. Reed's office works with all the other offices, but, and then Amy Envell's consulted, and then they're finally released. Your personal information, i.e. your personal cell phone, will not be released under public record, okay? So that's false. A lot of people are worried about that. And I don't want you to be worried about anything because we want you to sign up for this. District security is able to track you. No, we're not. Nor do I want to track you, okay? Like we told the folks in facilities that are out in your trucks, if we at BPS truly wanted to track you, we would do what the sheriff's office did, is put GPS devices on all of our cars so we can track where all of our cars and our resources are at so we can better allocate those resources. Right, Lieutenant? Yeah, Joe's laughing. Sure you are. Anyways. So we cannot track you. The only time that we can track you, and remember the video, remember the slide on geofence, is when you activate the emergency button. It's the only time. And who doesn't want to be tracked when we, you activate an emergency or where you're at? So that's the only time we know where you're at. All right, We don't see a bunch of little dots running around ESF. So that's false. Personal data plan is used. It's actually false and true. Remember, you have to have internet access to operate the app. All right, if you choose not to use the Wi-Fi and you want to use your data plan, that's your choice, as long as you've got an internet access. But we provide you Wi-Fi, very good Wi-Fi system to access the app. But if you choose to use your own data plan, then it will use your own data plan, so that would be true. Now here's the thing about the app. The app is a passive app, so it doesn't work in the background. So it's not running your battery down because you have an app. That's on there, like other apps. It doesn't use your battery, and it doesn't use your data plan. The only time it will use battery or data plan is when you activate the app, okay? So it doesn't work in the background. Now, when you set this app up, once we have you in the system, your name, your location, where you're assigned to, your email, and your cell phone number, uh, you're gonna be prompted when you download the app, which is free, once you download the app, it's gonna ask you location device. How do you wanna use that? All the time or only when the app is being used? Do you answer it by saying only when the app is being used? It's almost like Google Maps. Now, some of y'all might have set your apps up to where all the time your location device is on. I personally do that. It runs your battery down and then you don't know who in the uh, Google world or iPhone world or whatever don't track where you go and what, what happens. 
My only th is when I hit the rave, that's when it comes up for the location, okay? Only when the app is being used. So you don't have to worry about your battery going dead or uh, using your data plan. So it's only used when you have an emergency. District security has access to your phone to see your pictures, your videos, your emails, all your personal data. Absolutely false. No way to remotely access your phone. All we have the ability to do is assign you to a school and that is it, and remove you from a location of alerts, okay? Um, there's gotta be questions, folks. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We'll sign you to Gardendale. When you sign up and you get with your secretary, like I said, most of the secretaries have already sent in a spreadsheet. So if you go back to your work location and the secretaries don't have that spreadsheet, just send Audrey Lampkin directly an email and say, assign me to these locations. Okay, but she's gonna need all your information, your name, full name, email address, cell phone number, and then the locations you're assigned. So you'll be assigned to ESF and, and Gardendale. Okay, but very good question. Patrick? Hi, I work at uh, Palm Bay High and Noble High also, and the cell phone service there is horrible. How do I get into the kids' uh, Wi-Fi? Very good question, Patrick. Um, right now, for this current year, uh, if it does change, we'll let you know. If you, if you have your phone right now, take a look at your phone, and you go to your settings and look at your Wi-Fi connections. You're gonna have BPS, wireless, uh, student. There's another one that you might not see in there. If you don't see it, you go to, you, all you have to do is hit other and type in BPS guest, all one word, BPS guest, all capital letters, and it doesn't require a password. Now don't share that with family, friends, and visitors, and stuff like that, and you will not be kicked off of that. The lovely thing about BPS guest, and it's not plural, it's just G-U-E-S-T, BPS guest, all capitals, one word, is once you type that in, it will find it. It's on every single Wi-Fi, every BPS location. And then in your settings, you hit auto connect. Whenever you roll into this building, it will automatically connect that BPS guest. You'll go to Gardendale, it will automatically connect. Okay, doesn't matter what location you go to, it'll automatically connect and you'll be on our Wi-Fi, it will not kick you off. But great question, thank you. Brian. So I know this app is optional for staff members. If I choose not to download it, I don't use it, will I get in trouble? Very good question. You know, amazing enough, when we kicked off this project, the first two people that we met with was Vanessa Skipper and Anthony Colucci. As you know, right now there are current uh, union representatives uh, for BFT because we wanted, we wanted that partnership, wanted them to understand that this wasn't an encroachment on any of your rights or any of your protections. This was truly our intent with this project is to save your life and to save the lives of those around you and all the children that we serve. And once we explained this, the only concern that they had is that if you had a staff member within BPS, an employee, that failed to use the app, but made other notifications, would they be disciplined? I said, absolutely not. As, look, if you use this app or not, as long as we get notifications that to, for an emergency procedure, we're happy. Look, that campus monitor, his last name's Medina. It's all over the media. That's his last name. He only notified through two-way radio another campus monitor saying the crazy kid's on campus with a rifle. That's it. Three and a half minutes to put that school in lockdown. If you jumped on a phone system, intercom system, started screaming and yelling to put that school in lockdown or ESF in lockdown, I can care less as long as everybody knew there was an emergency and to do something to safeguard their life. And that's what we explained to them. They get it. Totally get it. They put language in a contract, made zero revisions to their language. Totally loved it. No, of course not, we went discipline them. But if you do nothing like what the campus monitor did at Marjorie Stoneman, yeah, you're darn right. They should be disciplined, no doubt about it, because people lost their lives and could have been saved that day if they would have done something. All we're saying is we're giving you a tool that's free. We're not tracking you, we can care less. We're putting a tool in the palm of your hand 
to make notifications to your fellow colleagues and to other students and everybody that we've got an emergency and you need to do one of three things, either evacuate, shelter in place, or lockdown, period. And then now we can communicate with you and have two-way communication when we have updates with a critical incident and we can operate better as an organization. Okay? Yes, ma'am. BPS guest is secured. If, it, if that is secure. Well, it depends how you, it's secured for the standpoint of using it for the app. Now mind you, we've opened that up with the help of IT so that you would have constant access to the internet to activate that app. If you're doing something else on your phone that you're concerned with, you know, making a purchase or, or communicate with somebody that you're concerned that somebody might get into your phone, from that standpoint, then you, you have other options. You can use something else. But I could tell you as far as the reliability and the security ability to use it for the app, we feel very comfortable with. So like, you know, just anybody out in the street can get onto oh, BPS no. Street, BPS Well, they guess. can get into our Wi-Fi, but they can't get into the app. Great question, though. I, I see where you're going with this. But they can get into, look, you could drive down the road and, and, and go through neighborhoods and do your little Wi-Fi and somebody might not have made it secure and you could tap into their Wi-Fi at their house and do whatever you want. I get that. Um, yeah, can they do that with BPS? Sure they can. We've got BPS guests, I mean, uh, wireless at, at schools that as a parent you can get it. But the app itself, as we're talking about with RAVE, nobody in this room will have access to it until we give you access. We have to put you into that system. If you downloaded loaded RAVE right now and went through it, you'll get to a point that says you don't have the authority to activate this app because we haven't put you in it. As quick as we put you in it, as quick as we could take you out. So don't think for a minute in district security, we're not seeing who is that threat. If that threat is an employee, then we can take them out like that. Literally click of a mouse and then deactivate their access card. There's things that we're doing behind the scenes monitoring that. But you cannot have, in general public has no access to this. This is only open to BPS employees and first responders, period. BPS employees and first responders. And my second question is, you had a list of uh, administration people for the emerg uh, medical emergency. Uh -huh. So do they, how do they cover like people who are on vacation and so if you hit something, you know, those four people are on vacation this week, so no response. <laughs> <laughs> no response. They hit the emergency <laughs> button and it's like, hey, sorry, everybody's out. <laughs> Wish you the best of luck. <laughs> Hear them sirens, they're coming just for you. No, it, it, it automatically goes to, uh, all those alerts will automatically go to the principals, the APs, and then also the SRO or the specialist. So there's always gonna be somebody on campus that will get those alerts. The other thing is too, is they also go to our comm centers and everything else. So we have, they'll be out of, I know when I send out an ESF email, for since we're here at ESF, it goes to over 700 people. So let's just say there's 350 people working here on a daily basis. There's probably gonna be well over 100 that have the medical alert. The probability is really slim to none that there won't be anybody to respond. But the medical one, remember that goes to 911, goes to all stakeholders. And the, the staff members and admin are the only ones that are signed up for medical, but it still goes to our first responders in 911, okay? So we'll never be in that situation that nobody gets the alert and responded. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Because it's so accurate, is it permissible and or advisable to use it personally? So, for example, if I'm at home and I have a fire, do I use the fire rave or do I use a regular like I would as a regular citizen? Very good question. You just remember that in order to identify to use the app for the emergency notification, you have to be in a geofence. Your home is not gonna be part of that geofence, okay? But if you did hold the fire button down, it's just a way of notifying 911. So you're gonna call 911, okay? Just to, it's, that, it, believe it or not, that's the number one thing in our presentations for people to really understand and grasp and apply it, okay? It's. Yeah, it's, it's entirely up to you. There's folks that like just to push their button so many times on the side of their iPhone to call 911. Other people just it will hold down their, 
and call 911. They have it set up in their, in their speed dial on their phone, 911. Whatever fits you. But if that's something that you're programmed to now, just to hit that app and hit fire or hit police 911 and then hit yes, call, that's fine. But it's not gonna tell us your name. It's, not, it's just like calling 911 when you're outside that geofence. Okay, excellent, very good question. Patrick. The preferred email, the question was, is, is there a preferred email that we want to utilize in the system? And it's yes. We don't want your personal email. We need the BPS email. So we don't need an AOL or a Gmail or, or whatever. We need your BPS email. Yes, ma'am. I don't believe our restrooms lock here at ESF. Um, there's no intent to lock the bathrooms right now. There was recommendations in Marjorie Stoneman Douglas to, for that feature, but that causes a lot more problems than it solves. Remember the probability of having that emergency on a campus or any of our locations isn't that great, but to have kids going in and smoking dope or fighting or criminal mischief or starting fires in bathrooms, is a lot more probable. Um, the, that, it's gonna be a decision you're gonna have to make. You're not gonna be able to lock the bathroom door, but if you stay where that ping is at, if, I, if, the, if the emergency wasn't to the level that I had to leave that location, then I'm staying where I pinged. Because guess what? That's where we're going to, is that ping. See where I'm at? is I would rather be where I know law enforcement is coming quicker. But if you know that that threat is imminent and it's safer for you to leave that location to safeguard yourself, by all means, don't stay right there. Go and get out and go, all right? But that's a good question. But yeah, you won't be able to lock that bathroom, all right? Yeah, that's where, to, you know, when you, yeah, you won't be able to lock it yourself. Yeah, no, but um, it is to pay attention to what name is and where people work at. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah, we, it, it, those are, yeah, you could have 101 different scenarios, but those are just things that you're gonna have to, you're better off staying put where you're at and not panicking and running out than to immediately run out. Stop and think for a minute and, and only leave when you have to. Yes, ma'am. In a lockdown, you're locking our doors, the ones that have the code? Not no. necessarily, because you gotta remember that they're already locked. You need a card to gain access to them. Oh yeah, that, that's the only time, because you gotta remember that once we lock those doors at ESF, your card no longer works. See what I'm saying? It works all the way around. Now, if we know that it's Matt Reed, sorry, Matt, <laughs> an easy target today, brother. But if it's Matt Reed and he's having a bad day, then we could shut down Matt Reed and he can't get anywhere. But now if he's got a hard key, he can get anywhere he wants. So, yeah, yeah. There's gotta be other rave questions. There's gotta be some more. Yes, ma'am. It is. It's as soon as we get your information, you will be notified back from Audrey. It's better off if you collectively put it together within your divisions and then we're able to send a group message back to everybody. And then you know you're in the system. Once you're in the system, activate the app and, and, and you're ready to roll. But we have over 3,000 people district ride right now that are signed up for RAVE. Yes, ma'am. We'll go over that right at the end okay. and, and separate of that because I don't know who set you up. You might have had the secretary send the whole unit. So she, she said you had no choice. You are signing her up. <laughs> That's classic. We got some principals like that. 
Because if you want to teach at my school, you will have this app. And I'm going, I love that. Absolutely love that. Any more questions? Oh, did we forget anything? Patrick. I, uh, I'm a bus driver. Hmm. And uh, will I get a notification while I'm driving the bus? The question was is that uh, Patrick's a bus driver, and he wants to know, well, if he's on this app, will he get the notifications? And the answer is yes. Remember, you can be anywhere in the world and receive notifications, okay? So they can receive notifications. Now, the difference for bus drivers, in the, as well as facilities and, and maybe some cafeteria workers that travel and also resource teachers, support personnel that travel a lot, they can only activate that emergency when they're on a campus or in a geofence. So for our bus drivers right now, they might be going down the road of course, they're not supposed to be on their cell phones, but if they had an emergency or something on that bus, they're not gonna be able to use the app to make a notification for it. But if they're in the bus loop at a school, then they can make a notification of it. But they can be on their way with their route and get an alert that, hey, South Lake is on lockdown, they got an emergency situation, and then they uh, don't pull into the South Lake and drop off kids. A good question, yes ma'am. Um, it, it, I don't believe so. You got to go through the Apple Store, Google. As long as you can download the app, uh, it would say Launchpad, like a like an iPad or something like that. No, no. You got to go through the Apple Store. It's a mobile app. And what's the one? Uh, what do you? Say? It's Rave. You, you just type in Rave Panic Button. It'll be a red square with a uh, white circle with the red exclamation point in the middle. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys very, very much. If you guys got any questions afterwards, by all means, don't hesitate to get a hold of district security. You see us in the hallway or the cafeteria or anywhere else, don't hesitate. And uh, please, you can share this with anybody and everybody. Uh, the more people we get signed up, the better off we are, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.